The Jerry Powell Podcast is brought to you by Archstone Foundation, improving the health and well being of older Californians and their caregivers. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast. This is Eric Padera. This is Alex Smith. And Alex, who do we have with us today? We are delighted to welcome Dong Chang, who is a pulmonary and critical care physician, intensivist, and associate professor at Harbor UCLA Medical Center and UCLA Medical School in Los Angeles. Welcome to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Dong. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And we're delighted to welcome back Ricky Leader, who is an attending physician in the Department of Psychosocial Oncology and Palliative Care at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston. Welcome back to the Jerry Powell Podcast, Ricky. Thanks so much. Great to be back. And we're going to be talking about uh, time-limited trials. Dong just published a paper not too long. I guess it was uh, in April, actually, on time-limited trials in patients with advanced medical illness and who are at risk for non-beneficial ICU treatments. Published in JAMA IM, Ricky did an editorial. Was it with uh, Tulsky too, James Tulsky? It was. Uh, both fabulous reads. We're going to be diving deep into that. But before we do, we always ask for a song request. Who has a song request for Alex? I do. Yeah. So uh, given the subject matter and in honor of the late, great drummer, Charlie Watts, I, uh, Alex, if you can play Time is on my side by the Rolling Stones. Yeah. Great drummer. Did see yeah. him in concert once when Rolling Stones did their first reunion tour. Um, incredible. Yeah, just yeah. A, a gentleman with sticks. Um, okay, here we go. Just a little bit. Time is on my side. Yes, it is. Time is on my side. Yes, it is. Now you always say that you want to be free, but you'll come running back, said you would, baby, you'll come running back, I said so many times before, you'll come running back to me. That was excellent and perfectly aligned with the topic at hand today. Time-limited trials. Doug, I'm going to turn to you first. How did you even get interested in this as a subject? Yeah, well, um, you know, it was kind of born out of this. Um, I became the the ICU director at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. It was kind of born out of this seeing a lot of non-beneficial treatments in the ICU for patients that have a lot of advanced illnesses. illnesses. And, and that's a very complex topic in terms of why this occurs. But one of the things that we certainly recognized was that there was imperfect communication between clinicians and our family members, a lot of misunderstandings about what the ICU treatments would do. And so what we really wanted to create was um, a quality improvement intervention that really dove down on trying to improve that communication, provide structure on it, and then really discuss patient preferences and values and what an ICU, uh, course of ICU care would do in the context of all that. And a time-limited trial, which is just simply um, agreements between clinicians and their family members to try certain ICU treatments for a period of time was a way that we operationalized that idea of trying to improve that communication. And Ricky, um, I feel like time-limited trials, it's a concept that's been out there for a while. You're a palliative care clinician. Do you use them? Do you see them frequently? I do. Yeah. I mean, I, I use them a lot. I would say um, I, one of the things I do clinically is I work on our kidney palliative care service. So we see a lot of patients whose kidney function isn't great. They may need dialysis. We're not sure if it's going to make them better. And in that situation, we'll often use time-limited trials, you know, get sort of everyone around the table, us, the nephrologists, oftentimes the the critical care docs or the the medicine people on the medicine floors and the families and say, look, let's, let's try this for a week 
and mm-hmm. see what happens. And if they get better, great. And if they don't, then we'll we'll change course. So yeah, I think I think they're an incredibly valuable tool clinically. Yeah. I mean, I feel like um, I've used them. I haven't really, and I think the the a really interesting top thing about this this quality improvement project that was published in JAMA IM, we'll have linked to it on the Jerry Powell website. It was like a, a standardized kind of bundle that really pushed for kind of time trials as the default. A why why that as a potential default doc? Like what wh- why not just like a you know a family meeting intervention that happened include like you can use time trials like a lot of palliative care doctors like at your own whim. Yeah, well, I think one of one of the reasons that we chose this was that um, you know I, I certainly don't have to tell you guys, but we're we're less evolved in in critical care and um, we're far less sophisticated <laughs> about communication and things like that and. What we wanted to create was was you know some standards, some some approaches that people could, these are really difficult conversations, yeah. and we wanted to create some tools and some standards that could be really um, you know make those conversations a little bit less challenging for our ICU physicians. And we all know that one of the most challenging conversations that we're going to have in the ICU is well, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned that these invasive treatments, they might not help your loved one or, or your family mm-hmm. member. How do you do that? And, and um, how do you create an opportunity for clinicians to really dive into that so that they're comfortable, but also productive? Um, we felt like a time-limited trial was, um, was, was the way to go. It provided structure around those difficult conversations, but it wasn't just this idea that we're going to just try this for a period of time. Um, if you dive into our protocol, it really was about creating situations to improve the shared decision making and have topics that are discussed that really promote that. So understanding preferences, values, really diving down into the risk of all these treatments. Mm-hmm. So I think it's it's that combination of things. We, we've had a lot of people who've done a lot of different like randomized trials and studies. And there's always this like the acceptability of the intervention. Mm-hmm. And here it's not. I mean, when I think about potentially inappropriate um, or non-beneficial care, it's not saying no. We're gonna, you're not going to get this thing. It's like we're going to hold on this hope. We're going to see how things go over the next couple of days, um, rather than a do or do not kind of approach. It's this like, let's see how much is the the time trial also giving uh, critical care doctors and other clinicians like making it like a more acceptable intervention. Yeah. Like well, um, on non hope. Well, I, I'll tell you that um, we, as part of our intervention, um, one of the first things that we did was we conducted some focus groups to get the temperature of the ICU physicians in terms of how they would feel about this and also clear up any miscommunications about what a time limited trial was. Um, that was really, really enlightening for me because the first focus group we had was actually at my own institution at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. And we would talk with our clinic. Now, remember, these are people that I work with every day and know very well. Yeah. And their initial reaction was, are you crazy? Because they thought when it was a time-limited trial, at the end of that trial, we would be basically telling families we're going to stop ICU care. Yeah. Ah. And they were so uncomfortable with the terminology and that idea I, I was actually confused. I was like, why is everyone looking at me like I have just lost it? And yeah. it was just clearing up that semantics and actually describing exactly what you said, Eric. This is an opportunity to refine prognosis and actually offer some hope and, and do the things that we want to do, but maybe set some rational limits around it. And once we did that, you know, the, the room lightened up. Everyone understood uh-huh. what we're trying to accomplish. And, and it was relatively smoother after that. But it is really about what you're describing and the key point there is that at the end of the time limited trial, um, what do you do? You go back to you don't say, "Well, it's over. It didn't work. It didn't meet the endpoint. Um, we're going to disconnect the vent." Um, Here's the contract. You signed it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but instead, you go back to the family and you say, "Here, what do you say? Like, here's the information that we've gathered um, from this time limited trial." This is where we are. This uh, this is how far we've come in terms of coming close to the endpoints we talked about. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we kind of decide what are the main things that we're going to follow during this time in the trial. What are the important clinical outcomes that would tell us that 
you know, the family member is improving or not improving. In reality, we have almost daily communications with them, even without formal family meetings. So there's a lot of communication at the bedside. So I think they're constantly being updated in terms of how we're doing. But then the, the family meeting is kind of a more formal structured discussion that wraps mm-hmm. up all the information that we've been getting. And then it's oftentimes another time on the trial, or, or maybe we're, we're at a place where we could be fairly definitive about how things are, and then we make our decisions from there. And Ricky, um, having done a lot of these time limited trials, it sounds like um, I always think back to Tim Quill's article on JAMA. I think it was like 2011, how to think about time limited trials. Any tips around structuring these? Because it, it could also feel a little bit little goosey. Yeah, like, you know, we'll, we'll meet again. We'll talk about if it's working. Yeah. I mean, I think those are the ones that don't go as well. <laughs> you know, I, I think the, the more specific you can be in laying out what we're looking for, right? You know, what we're doing and what we're all hoping for and looking for. And also, I think <laughs> what I've seen is, you know, people will talk about what happens if they get better. And they'll talk about what happens if they get worse, but they don't talk about like what happens if they're in the exact same spot, mm-hmm. right? And then everyone's coming back the week later or whatever it is and saying, well, we're in the same place. What do we do now? Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, being clear about those sort of three situations can be helpful. Mm-hmm. And also, I mean, I think one thing that time limited trials do well is they acknowledge uncertainty. And I think acknowledging uncertainty there too to say, you know, we're hoping that this gives us more information. And also there may be still think there may still be things we don't know at the end of this trial and that and that's okay. And we're gonna we are committed to caring for this this person, your loved one, and you know, and figuring out where to go next. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd say I use time limited trials routinely in the ICU setting. Um, and that's uh I uh, and when doing, but this is slightly different, right? Because I'm coming in as a palliative care consultant, often not on the day that they're admitted to the ICU, often after, I think you excluded several of these patients from your study, potentially, you know, patients who came in were initially like, oh, let's try this, let's try that. And then things aren't going well. And then tension develops with family members. And then they call in palliative care. And in the pre meeting, I try and refocus the ICU clinicians around, let's, go into this family meeting and let's with the objective of perhaps presenting a time limited trial after we get through, you know, prognosis and goals of care and, you know, bringing the patient into the room and all that. Let's talk about, you know, how we could frame our next step as a time limited trial. And that kind of, I think is like really educational for the ICU clinicians in terms of reframing their thinking, because, uh, you know, so much in ICU is about, um, like uh, we were to have this, we had a podcast about nudges, right? And there's this like sunk cost thought, you know, by the time I get there, like we put all this work in and we're just going to continue. And then like Ricky says, they're going to continue at this um, same space and we're at the same space we were before. And we'll just continue on that for a long period of time. I don't really have a question here. It was more of an observation. <laughs> it's a good observation, Alex. I wanted to though jump into this trial. Um, if it's okay, I'm going to start off with dog, so you had three medical centers all in LA, all academic, like there were all trainees there. Um, who did you include in in this population of patients? And this is all pre-COVID, right? It was a quality improvement, pre-post yeah. kind mm-hmm. of design. Yes, uh, pre-COVID, um, pre and post design, and uh, and you're absolutely right. Uh, it was it was uh, training centers, and I think you certainly have to understand that that adds a wrinkle um, in terms of both flexibility and trainability, but also how this sustains and things like that. Yeah. But um, in, in terms of who we, who we included um, in the patient population, um, you know, we, we used a rough guideline from the Society of Critical Care Medicine that um, puts categories in terms of the likelihood that someone would benefit from ICU care, but those categories are very, very nonspecific. And essentially, it comes down to a clinician's assessment of, is this patient going to be so sick, both in terms of their acute level of illness or their existing comorbidities or their functional status, so that these somewhat invasive things that I'm going to have to put them through, they are unlikely to benefit at the end of this, whether it's because they will be even more functionally limited or the patient is just so sick that our chance of recovery is, is really low. 
And we actually thought about, we, we grappled with this. Um, each hospital is a little bit different. The patients that they see and the people that might be at risk for non-beneficial treatments are a little bit different. Um, and so, you know, just out of, out of the necessity of respecting all of that and also keeping things practical, we basically left it at the clinician's sense that the patient would be at very high risk for non-beneficial treatments is good enough. We had each of the ICU directors come up with a series of cases that might illustrate for their ICU the types of patients that we would be interested in. Mm -hmm. And then we also got feedback from the clinicians. In the end, we also instructed them that we want this to be pretty straight. We, we don't want super gray cases. We want you to feel relatively strongly that these were patients who are unlikely to benefit from ICU care. Mm -hmm. And we place that caveat on it as well. And what, what did you do as far as the intervention? Yeah, the intervention was um, was a lot of training. So what we basically wanted to do was try to address all of the barriers that were in place for communication to not occur well. So um, first was creating expectations and some structure. I know on, on, on these podcasts, you guys have talked so, so importantly about how communication should be viewed as a procedure. We love procedures in our ICU and that language resonates with us. And so we wanted to create something like that. So um, basically, it was a focus group that, as I described, that kind of dive, dives down into what are the barriers, what, what are we struggling with, what should we create for your institution. Then it was a set of didactics to try to explain what we're doing, non-beneficial treat treatments and the benefit of time limited trials. And then the most fun of all was um, simulation with, uh, with patient actors. Fortunately, we're in Los Angeles, so we have plenty of actors. <laughs> we had people come in, and then we had our fellows and our attendings come and do these simulations of family meetings using the protocol, and that was just a blast. But I think it was also very educational. Then we had the, a checklist format protocol in place for clinicians to use. We had somebody schedule the meetings to try to overcome that barrier, and then we had follow-up meetings and feedback meetings to see how things were going. And I love in the supplement, you can actually see kind of the format of the family meeting. We'll have links to that on our Jerry Powell show notes too. So you can actually see kind of what was expected in these family meetings. So it sounds like, again, like a, a bundle of interventions around family meetings. Right. Um, okay. So I'm just going to jump to the results unless anybody has any other questions. So this well, is I have a question. Yeah. Could you give us a like a sample like of, you know what what kind of patient um, scenario they came up with who would qualify for this study in the ICU? Sure. So um you know for one of the hospitals they had um, a lot of patients who had end stage end stage uh, liver disease, so cirrhosis mm -hmm. and it would be very common for them to come in with an upper GI bleed in which they were then placed on the mechanical ventilator and mm -hmm. getting resuscitation. But it turns out that they were really not doing so well in the outpatient setting that had a slow deterioration of functional status. They were coming back for paracentesis all the time. Their, their quality of life was really deteriorating. They had a really high acute level of illness. They were not a transplant candidate. We didn't see things down the line that could improve that. And that would be somebody that would be very common for that hospital. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. All right, outcomes. I think this is pretty impressive because if you looked, so again, before, after the study, pre post, big outcomes, your intervention was associated with a pretty big reduction in ICU stay by a decrease of a day, fewer invasive procedures, no change in mortality, and higher family satisfaction. I just, I need to jump to the figure. Um, so it was like figure two. We'll see if we can add a picture of it. We'll probably get sued by Jim. I am on our blog post, but like you see, it was kind of steady before the intervention started, kind of length of stay, hovering a little bit over, over 10. And then right when the intervention occurred, you see a remark remarkable kind of decrease in length of stay. Mm -hmm. Ricky, when you saw this, what'd you think? Uh, this is a great intervention. Like, how do we bring this to our hospital? Well, I mean, I thought it was really impressive. And I thought, you know, if you look at the um, the mortality data, too, that there wasn't really a change. I mean, I think I think it shows that the time limited trials can can work. And I think, you know, what I when I, I looked at that and then I looked at the components of the 
of the meetings and you see that you know conversations about goals and values prognostic disclosure all of the elements of the family meeting that you know in our palliative care world we would want to see mm-hmm. went up mm-hmm. you know the combination of those two findings gives you gives you a sense that okay this we're we're it looks like we might be increasing goal concordant care here for these mm-hmm. really sick patients so i saw that figure and i was excited yeah if I, could, if, I could, yeah, if I could, if I could comment on that, um, maybe the other way to look at it, um, I, I really appreciate that comment. Maybe the other way to look at it was um, we were in a position where we had a lot of room for improvement. So because this is a before and after study, I think we certainly have to recognize that um, if you look at just the conversations that we were having in the pre-intervention phase, there were plenty of opportunities for improvement. We were actually not discussing things like values and preferences. It's almost embarrassingly low for me. But on the other hand, I think this is consistent with the literature that we have in critical care medicine, that the conversations often do go like that, where we're just discussing medical issues and not discussing some of these other components. So, um, you know, we tried to make the point that I think environment and context is really important to try to understand in these sorts of studies. And I think that's certainly the case with us. Yeah, I just want to highlight half of the patients that were, it was a documented uh, values and preferences in the notes uh, pre and nearly 100%, 98.3% post intervention had documented values and preferences. Is it documented, Doc? Like it's actually notes? um it's actually obtained through uh, study coordinators who were participating as just uh, as just um, observers in the family. Oh wow. So you actually had real live ideas of what was happening during those family meetings. I got a question for you though. I look at figure one and I think, you know, most interventions, it takes time to work. Like there's a time to benefit. I start somebody on a stat and it takes like a couple of years to work. Even a quality improvement, there's usually like a, you know, a time for people to start using the intervention. So we're not going to see a pretty big drop initially as people get used to it. Why do you think you saw a pretty immediate drop? Yeah, well, that's a that's a really good question. It actually touches a little bit on why do we see a benefit in the first place? And it's hard to piece out with a multifactorial intervention. Um, I will say that we did allow a little bit of time for practice to catch up, meaning that um, you know we didn't collect data immediately after training. We allowed for a little bit of time. We allowed clinicians to, to play with it a little bit. There was a month period um, in which we were training just observing and then starting the data collection after that. So I think the practice did start to um, kind of hit whatever equilibrium we're gonna we're gonna allow it to hit. But you know, the other things that we should definitely keep in mind was in addition to the contents of the meetings, the meetings were occurring more frequently and earlier. And that in and of itself might have an effect on making decisions a little bit earlier in the ICU and so forth. So that could certainly um, affect the ICU length of stay. I do think the content mattered though. And I think by the time that we we're collecting data, I think the family meetings were very rich with the sorts of things that we wanted people to talk about. And I guess in any of these types of studies, again, practical, like they're happening in real life, they're not 100% standardized. There's always this question of, okay, but what what really worked here? Was it time trials? Was it, you know, earlier family meetings which occurred here was it more addressing like values and preferences was it things like nudging that you encourage people to do? It, we used to always talk about aducanumab in every podcast now we're talking about nudging in nudging. every podcast <laughs> cuz i also noticed that um like in one of the one of in your in your guide on having these family meetings it's like in such circumstances, most patients and family members choose to change the goals of ICU care towards focusing on comfort, recognizing that invasive treatments are unlikely to reverse illness. So, so that was part of the time limit of trial discussion, which yeah. I learned from our nudging podcast is a nudge, right? Um, most patients and people don't want to be not like most patients or most family members. What do you What do you think worked here? Or can we even say what worked here? I can't really say what what worked. I, if I had to guess, I would say it's. The, I think it has to be the combination of stuff. I think they're synergistic, 
And um, you know, we had a we had a letter to the editor and a reply, and I I tried to make the case that um, and the question was, well, you know, part of the question was, it's this multi-component thing. We need to sort of piece out what worked and what drove the outcomes. Mm -hmm. But I made the case that it's it's perhaps synergistic. What's the point of having an early meeting if we're really not discussing the things that are going to be helpful in shared decision making? What's the point of having a meeting at day seven when so many things have happened and then now we're talking about, well, you know, completely changing the direction and saying, okay, let's now talk, try to get to know the patient at this point and um, talk about time limited trials at this point. I think they have to work together. And I do think there's a synergistic component, but um, I certainly recognize the need to, to try to really isolate what might be effective, um, the most effective part of the intervention. But I think they work together. I think it's different in different people. Um, and I think it's really hard to piece out. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Ricky? I, I agree. I agree. I mean, I think it would be very hard to separate the components of this out anyways, right? I mean, I think to do a time limited trial without components of like eliciting someone's goals and values and talking about prognosis. I don't know what that would be a time, you know, that'd be a bad time limited trial. Right. And, and so I, I, I think that, you know, we, we do know that conversations around goals and values when we talk about prognosis, that they, they have benefit, right? I mean, although the data in the ICU have been kind of variable. And so I, I think Don's findings, like given what the intervention is, it, I don't know how much it matters exactly what's going on, to the, to, that it really works. And this is a good, a good strategy. Well, speaking, you bring up variable, right? Um, some <laughs> interventions. In my mind, one study comes directly into my mind is the Jamma Carson article on chronically critically ill patients. In the title, it has the word palliative in it. Oh, it was palliative care led meetings, which were usually one or two fast food style meetings. You talk about prognosis, goals, and then you leave. And that actually increased PTSD symptoms in patients. Like it was not a negative, it was a, it potentially hurt people. At least that's what Fox News said. Um, but it tells us potentially, I love that trial because it tells us what not to do in palliative care. Some people say it's not a palliative care trial. I think it is a palliative care trial. And it tells us like fast food palliative care does not work. Um, just going in, going out for chronically critically ill patients, probably not the best. And it was a really important study because it tells us what not to do. I love this one because it tells us, hey, like this is a great intervention we're calling quality improvement project. It's longitudinal. There's a lot of great primary palliative care going on here. We don't know, right, Don? I, I read this in your your. Your, comp, your letter to the editor reply, we don't know whether or not palliative care was increased or decreased in this group, right? That's correct. Yeah. It's something we, we should have collected. We just, we just didn't have the Maybe a follow-up study there. Yeah. You know, <laughs> um, but you know, one thing that I wanted to mention, I don't know if it's a mechanism, but maybe it's an explanation. One thing that I wanted to mention in terms of our results that I don't know if it helps explain um, some of the results and the findings, but if you look at the supplement, one of the things that we offered was the length of stay um, over the course of the study in the pre and the post intervention phase. And so the length of stay goes something like this. There's a lot of variability. It goes up and down. And I know the listeners can't see my hands and moving around, but there's just a lot of long ICU stays. And then we have kind of this baseline of your typical ICU stay, lots of spikes, lots of spikes. And then in the post-intervention phase, a lot of those spikes get either attenuated or go away. And the way that I interpreted that was not that these were outlier cases, but if you think about what a time-limited trial is doing, is really trying to put some patient-centered boundaries around those cases that really have this protracted ICU invasive, you know, the, the momentum that you guys are talking about. And I, I do think that part of our intervention was to just take some of those things and, and just blunt the outliers and make sure that we're not providing this extended period of ICU treatments, breaking that momentum that, that we oftentimes have as ICU physicians to, to invest and do more and more and more and, and, and do that. So I, I think that's one of the explanations for why we saw the reduced ICU length of stay. If you look at our mean versus our median, it totally reflects it. The mean drop is a lot greater. And it had a bigger impact, right, on the people who 
died. Is that yes, right? That's correct. Yeah. Why is that? Why do you think? Well, um, you know, what I like to, what I would hope for is the idea that, um, that for the patients who were unlikely to survive uh, ICU care and ICU uh, benefit from ICU treatments, mm -hmm. that um, we were able to identify those people and identify them through longitudinal assessments. And then they had some, um, some boundaries placed on the amount of suffering and, and, and things that they would have to go through. I was really, really nervous that um, that we might have some unintended consequences and de-escalation in treatments that would be reflected in differences in mortality. Uh, fortunately, we didn't, but I think we have to recognize that that's always a danger to this this sort of uh, conversation and, and intervention. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that half of your about half of the study uh, were Latinx um, patients. Um, I, I'm wondering if professional translators were used during these family meetings um, or, you know, how you, how you, um, how you handled potential language issues. I don't yeah. know if they had limited English proficiency or not. Yeah. They, they, it is very common in all three hospitals for us to um, have people that aren't super comfortable with English family members and so forth. We do use translators and we kept this very pragmatic and, and, and practical but in all honesty, um, we also have the benefit of uh, most, a lot of people in Southern California are, are very good at speaking Spanish. So language concordance um, was common because a lot of our staff do speak Spanish, but we didn't use interpreters as necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Ricky, here's a question. I often, you know, I, how broadly should we think about time limited trials? Um, I, when I think about them, I think as you wrote wonderfully in your essay that time limited trials are a way of helping us manage our uncertainty and they help us manage our uncertainty over time because when most people write about uncertainty i've written about uncertainty other people have written about it we often think about the uncertainty in the moment and what time limited trials allow us to do is to manage that uncertainty in conversation with family members of seriously ill patients over time and to narrow down that uncertainty um, uh, in repeated conversations, because as we know, it's, you know, as Eric said, like palliative care is not ideally an initial one-time consult. And that goes for consulting palliative care and for primary palliative care. Um, I, I wonder if you, if you have more to say, or if you would want to share some of your thoughts about the management of uncertainty, uh, with time limited trials. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a great question. A great point. I mean, cause when I, when I read your study, Dong, I mean, the, the thing that jumped out at me, I mean, I, clearly the, the, the results for the patients, but I was thinking about it, like how this affects the, the clinicians in, in the ICU, you know, and this is one of the things that we write about is, you know, and I've seen this happen in residency and it happens with us in palliative care too, is there's a sense of therapeutic nihilism, mm. right? You know, this person's never going to benefit from from the ICU. And once that narrative sets in, it can be really hard to break. And those are often cases where we're called in palliative care, right? Where the ICU team may be saying, look, we don't think this person's going to get better. We want to protect them from further intensive interventions, more, more suffering. And the family is not there. It's not where their goals and values are, are at. And that, and that leads to frustration and, you know, communication challenges. And I think what the time limited trial does is it injects uncertainty into the clinician's judgment, right? Sort of by necessity, you're saying, hey, I, I hope, I'm hoping right there with you that that you're, this person gets gets better, that what we're doing in the ICU is helpful. And I'm I'm worried that it may not be. And here's how we can we can think about it going forward. So, you know, you think about your medical decision making where you've got your pre-test probability and your post-test probability and you know all of that stuff we learned you know the sort of the clinical epi people will teach us and a time limited trial is kind of the same thing right you've got your pre time limited trial prognostic estimate as a team and then you do the trial and you adjust based on the results of the trial to think about a post-test prognostic estimate and so i think just injecting that uncertainty for the clinicians 
it's a nudge, right? It's a nudge to say, we don't know what's going to happen here. So let's align with the, with the families, hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Well, it's interesting because in this study, you had clinicians to get enrolled as a patient. You had to have a clinician say, they're at very high risk for uh, non-beneficial care. Um, uh, and then what happened is, what, 40% were still alive on hospital discharge. So it tells you that, um, you know, again, I, I don't, was it at high risk or they thought really likely that they were going to have non beneficial care? Like, like wh- what was the actual enrollment? It sounded a lot, a lot more subjective. And it turns out like it was a little less than a coin flip. What were your thoughts on that, Doc? Well, I, I think our biases and prognostication are, are well known, uh, especially in the ICU. I think. That that does that point doesn't have to be made. Um, but on the other hand, maybe the one thing that that I could also add is that um, what we didn't capture that we absolutely should is what were they like on discharge. So it's it's quite function. It's quite possible that um, their quality of life may have been severely compromised. Um, I I have a feeling that's the case. But I also think there were many cases where the clinicians felt like this this might be non beneficial, and they were pleasantly surprised. Mm-hmm. And I think you know a time limited trial really allows for that sort of thing. And um, and and you can also get, as, as Ricky said, a little bit more certain about how things are just by allowing for a little bit of time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, a, a point that I also wanted to make was that in addition to the effects on the clinicians, I think there was a profound effect. Um, of a time limited trial on the surrogate decision makers and the family. And mm. it was very common for us to um, have have family members that just simply didn't know what was going to happen in the ICU and not understand what it means to have a tube in the throat, um, to, to occasionally even be you know bound, um, to have these medications that are infusing in. And just being able to see that again in pre-COVID times. Um, and see how much the nurses and the physicians paid attention to details and, and came by. I think that put us on the same team. Um, and, and I think that was really important. It was something that we just simply can't capture with data and place in an article, but it was really, really nice to see. Mm-hmm. That's actually a question I had for you, Dong, if it's okay, Alex. Yeah. 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 I was wondering, I mean, have you collected um, surrogate level outcomes at all? You know, Eric was talking about, you know, surrogate family PTSD and some other studies or Doug White study looked at anxiety and, and depression. And I'm just wondering if, if you've looked at it or you, you plan to in the future so we kind of understand the, the longer term effects of this. Yeah, that's um, it, and you make such an excellent point about that in the editorial. I think it's something that we have to do, especially things like trying to capture anxiety, depression, and PTSD at a later time point. I think, you know, that's been really well done by Doug White and others, and we certainly need to do that. What we did was um, we tried to at least capture some information on satisfaction. I think we had a little bit of a ceiling effect of everyone was extremely generous with their comments on our satisfaction, and so we couldn't really piece out whether it changed over time. But um, we also did some qualitative studies that we're still working on right now. just trying to gauge um, people's perceptions on the decision making and how the experience was. Mm. I think it's really complex. I, um, you know, for the most part, my sense is that people appreciated the opportunity to be in a time limited trial. But you know, we even heard feedback like, "Boy, when, when you said that uh, we're going to meet again in five days, those are five grueling days at times." And mm-hmm. um, you know, the, all of that has to be respected as well. Yeah. Here, here's something I teach my trainees. Okay. This is like blowing up time-limited trials, maybe a little bit too far. But it's counter because most clinicians, right, they think about everything as open-ended. They don't think about things as being, you know, having a, you know, a test period, for example. So I like to tell my trainees, everything is a (laughs) time-limited trial. Life is a time-limited trial, right? We're always gathering more information and then reassessing as we go through our life. Well, maybe at the end of life, we don't get to say, um, I'd like some more, please. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but Alex, I, when does it become like just kicking the can down the road? Like, oh, we don't have to make a decision now. We can make it later. Like, when, it, when is it about just delaying an inevitable decision? 
Yeah, I think at some point it gets to be delaying an inevitable decision. And I'm somebody who often the teams will consult me, right? And they'll say, you know, we really feel that this treatment is non beneficial. We need it to end. Help us end it. And I turn back to them and I say, uh, we need to meet the patient, form a relationship with them, get to know them, get what, to know what's important to them or their surrogate, you know, their family member. Um, get to understand uh, what their values are, what they're hoping for, what they're afraid of, what their goals and values are. And then talk about prognosis, what's likely ahead. And then we could talk about, let's think, and then I I often recommend, rather than jumping to let's stop this (laughs) because it doesn't seem to align. um, Well, let's, let's see, you know, should we try it, um, continue to try this for another, you know, this whatever life sustaining treatment for another period of time, but I'll vary that period. And I'm curious what period of time, um, you know, were selected uh, in your trial uh, by the intensivist, uh, you know, for, for something that's really pretty darn clearly non-beneficial, I'll have a shorter period of time. For something where I think like, you know, there might be something here, and particularly with trainees, and many of the clinicians in your study, if I'm understanding correctly, Dong, were trainees, they often don't have a sense of when somebody does have, a, a, you know, a better prognosis, like they're, they look like they're on the brink of death. But, you know, the more seasoned clinicians know that actually there has has a decent chance they may get through this. And then I find myself as the awkward palliative care clinician saying, actually, (laughs) there's a decent chance they may get through this. I know Eric's like, yeah, you're just kicking the can down the road. Uh, But Dong, how about the the links of uh, time periods in these time limited trials? Sure. It was exactly as you described, Alex, which is um, it's really dependent on the clinical situation. So, um, You know, for instance, somebody who is extremely ill and it looks like they're going to declare a direction pretty soon, it would be a relatively short time in the trial. They're also going through a lot and we don't really want to extend that any longer than we have to. But there are patients who have chronic critical illness where it might be a week, it might be a little bit longer. So um, it really depended on the clinical situation. Um, A very common scenario for us was if someone came in in a cardiac arrest, And then we would start to do a series of prognostic assessments at 48 and 72 hours and see where we're at and start the conversation at that point. So um, it it, it really varied. Um, I will say I I loved your comment on everything is a time limited trial. You know, that's actually feedback that we got back from a lot of our clinicians um, who were initially really reluctant to do time limited trials. And then at the end, you know, what they were saying, well, we just, you're not doing anything special. We do this all the time. This is what we do. <laughs> we, we start and then we see how things go. And so I think they came around to your, your way of thinking, Alex. I got one more question. Uh, time-limited trial outcomes creep, where you have a time-limited trial, three days later, outcomes, it didn't, didn't meet them, but you meet again and new outcomes are are address the family like things and we have another time limited trial and then the new outcomes i think we've probably seen these scenarios ricky have you seen this and what do you do around this yeah i mean i think you've got to sort of diagnose where the issue is right like is it that the the team the clinicians are worried about putting their nickel down and saying look we tried this it's not working we're in, we're not in a great place now let's let's redirect, you know, towards, towards comfort. Um, or is it that the family, you know, there's, there's a communication difficulty there, their prognostic awareness isn't, isn't aligned with, with ours, or they had a misunderstanding. Right. So I think, cause I've seen both, right. Sometimes it's the clinicians being like, ah, I just want to give them some more time. And you're like, well, mm-hmm. what are we really hoping for here? Or if it's family distress, then, you know, I think then that we've got communication tools for that. For that too, so it it can it can be appropriate, right? If the situation changes in unexpected yeah. ways, but yeah. So you got to diagnose the problem. Yeah. All right. Last, yeah. actually, I said that was my last question, but this is my last question to both yeah. of you. Quickly, if you had a magic wand, you can make any changes as far as what should people do with the outcomes of this study. Dong, what are you hoping from ICU clinicians? I am hoping that ICU clinicians understand the importance of communication done well, uh, trained as a procedure, really, really understanding that it does make a difference. 
but also understanding context and the proper way to train and um, and really implement that in a, in a way that makes sense for their institution. And I love that. Like we use simulation for a lot of things. Like we should be using it for communication. It's just as important as putting in a lines or Ricky. Uh, what's your magic wand for palliative care providers? What should they do differently, if anything, from this study? I, I think um, acknowledging prognostic uncertainty and helping teams acknowledge prognostic uncertainty amongst teams and you know with, with patients and families too early on. Yeah. I think that's the fascinating thing about uncertainty. We always try to think about minimizing our uncertainty, but I think this is a good example of... Honestly, this is about increasing uncertainty. Like we don't know, like you said, and sometimes patients and family members are hungry for more uncertainty and not less. So with that, thank you both for joining us. But before we let you out of here, Alex, do you want to finish up with a little bit more time is on our side? A little more time is on my side. Time is on my side. Yes, it is. Side. Yes, it is. Cause I got the real love, the kind that you need. Oh, but you're come running back, said you would, baby. You're come running back, I always said you would. You're come running back to me. Oh, yeah, time. Yes, it is. Time is on my side. Yes, it is. Dong and Ricky, big thank you for joining us on this podcast today. Thanks so much. much. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Uh, thank you to Archstone Foundation for your continued support. And to all of our listeners, thank you for supporting the Jerry Powell Podcast. Do us a favor. Send this out to one of your colleagues and ask them to do a time trial. Listen to the Jerry Powell Podcast for half an hour. If you like it, finish the whole episode. And with that, good night, everybody. 